like to welcome everybody to Deep Learning Introduction. So today we're gonna to be talking about a high level view of, of uh, deep learning. And uh, then we're gonna talk about some suggestions about how to get started and also some resources that are available to you. So first we're gonna talk about AI and how that intersects with deep learning. Then we're going to talk about uh, AI versus deep learning. And we're going to be taking a look at, look at a case study of some work that we're actually using, that we're uh, uh, in the process of, uh, uh, of undertaking right now uh, with a professor in, in, uh, who does archaeology here on campus. Then we're going to talk a little bit about how deep learning works. Uh, then we're going to talk about special considerations you have to keep in mind. Uh, uh, to, to, to make uh, deep learning work and, and what, what uh, impact that has on the choices that we can make in terms of the compute, in terms of uh, uh, the decisions that you should make when you're building these types of models. Then we're gonna talk about frameworks that make all of this easier for you. And at the very end, we're gonna do breakout rooms. We're gonna have an opportunity to do some hands-on AI using what are called transformer models uh, for natural language processing. And then I'm gonna end with a couple of special announcements at the very end. So uh, before we get started, are there any questions? All right, then let's start by taking a look at what's meant by AI. And the fact is that what's meant by AI has changed over the years. So way back in the 1950s, AI was the general problem solver, which, which had the ability to, uh, uh, which was really the first attempt to, to solve general types of problems. These were not very general problems, uh, but around the same time, you could uh, have a program that could play checkers. That was simply not possible before. Keep in mind the compute power that was available at the time. Then in the, uh, uh, around in the 60s, uh, came the very first perceptron. This was uh, an artificial neural, uh, an artificial neuron, the very first uh, implementation of something that looked like it was biologically motivated. And not too long after that, the idea that you could actually string multiples of these together and solve interesting problems. Uh, also around the same time uh, came around the idea of, of expert systems. And it, at each time, all these different things were called AI uh, in their time. So, why didn't expert systems stick around? Well, it turns out that they were rather brittle. The idea was that you could interview experts, you could encode all knowledge that they had to solve new types of problems. But it turns out that taking that approach of trying to understand and encompass all the knowledge of an individual by asking questions and by structuring that turned out to be very difficult to make something that was, that was fluid, uh, that didn't break, that could generalize. Then come along neural nets. And these seemed very, very promising at the time. I, I did some early uh, work applying neural nets to problems in psychology. And uh, so promising, they seemed to be able to, to mimic human learning in some ways and, and human capabilities, but we, but we just reached a point where we couldn't make them any larger. Uh, we ran into the problems where they couldn't be trained any further. Compute was simply not there, was not available. So we went into really a period that, that was uh, sometimes referred to as the, the AI winter. Then we started to, to, to see the benefits of machine learning algorithms. Uh, if you're talking to a statistician, these are gonna be statistical learning algorithms. But uh, the idea of being able to take large amounts of data and to, to build a predictive models uh, using these. So what these models will look like is you have to have structured information, you feed them the structured information, you have the outcome. So it might be a binary outcome, it might be a class, that it's making a prediction on. And these are all different methods that you can use to, uh, to uh, answer and make a generally uh, generalizable uh, solution. Now we are in the area, in the uh, era where deep learning is available. So remember before I mentioned, you know, 1980s, late 1980s neural nets, and we ran into the problem where we couldn't push them any further. Well, it turns out that there was some beautiful work that, that took place uh, uh, around 2010 and, and, and later that solved a number of these problems. Plus, you had additional compute in the form of graphic processing units. So 
gaming cards, essentially, that allowed you the compute that you would need to make these work. And now you have ever larger and growing uh, deep learning uh, models that, that you can train. And in many ways, machine learning models and deep learning models are capable of some of the same things, but deep learning is capable of other things as well. So let, let's compare them, but let's compare them using uh, a case study. So uh, I'm going to ask Professor Ebrill, are you are you here on the uh, on the call? You may not be. You are welcome. Oh, and let me go ahead and allow you to uh, unmute yourself. So I'd like to thank you for allowing us to uh, to use your, your data set here to talk a little bit about your research. Perfect. So. Um, I'll just run through this quickly, but uh, Professor Ebel, if you can correct me if I get anything of, of, uh, wrong in this. But my understanding is that you are interested in, in looking at, uh, at Mayan sites in, in Guatemala, and you're looking at, uh, at, at the, the, the cultural and, and uh, what was happening in these sites uh, in the time of, of the Mayans. And one of the ideas uh, that, that you've been working with is that you might be able to detect where stone napping was occurring. So where the creation of stone tools were, were taking place. And the way that you've described it to me is that you can do this because even though a stone napper will probably clean up his or her leavings because they're very sharp, uh, they can be dangerous, there's only so small a piece of that micro debitage, that leavings of the, of the stone working that can be picked up. And so there's always a little bit which is mixed into the into the soil and left behind. Is, is that about right? Yeah, that, that is perfectly, yeah. Absolutely. Perfectly adequate. It's okay for you to say adequate. <laughs> All right. So one of the other interesting things was that you had the idea of going ahead and collecting experimentally derived leavings. So you actually brought a stone napper in, had him create stone tools for you so you could have ground truth of what these small particles would look like. And then you had the idea of using a particle analyzer, often used in industry, to analyze each individual particle to get 40 different measures of the size, the volume, uh, the transparency, and then to ask the question, could you do an analysis of both the known stone napping leavings, the lithic micro uh, debitage, and the soil samples, and actually pick out which particular particles in each of the soil samples uh, was likely to be micro debitage. Does that sound about right? Yeah, you're perfect, yeah, absolutely. And I thought this was so interesting, it's such a neat idea. And so what does that particle analyzer do? Well, the particle analyzer takes pictures of each individual particle as it falls. And as it tumbles, it's able to determine 40 different types of measures. You see some of the measures here. You have area, area perimeter, volume, centroid. You also have things like, uh, like transparency. So 40 different measures. And so the data kind of looks like this. So over here, you have the particle ID. You have the image ID, because remember, you have images for each one of these things as well. And then you have what the source is. Did it come from the site? Or was it experimentally uh, derived? And did it actually come from, from your known source of micro -debitage? So this is a great machine learning problem. And those of you who were here at the intro to machine learning uh, uh, two weeks ago, we actually worked with this data and we actually came up with new results from Professor Ebrill during that workshop where we, we got some really pretty good performance where we could differentiate between particles. What was soil? and what was known lithic micro -debitage. But here's a question. We had to come up with these different engineered features. And what if these are not the most important features? So this is capturing things along the lines of, uh, you know, as you're seeing here, you know, the, the volume, the area, the transparency, the roundness and concavity, those types of, of measures that you might uh, look at, but it's not necessarily getting a look at, at other aspects that might be important. So 
here's some particles that are from a uh, scanning electron microscope. And uh, a couple of things here. Um, first of all, and, and through chat, or, or you can unmute yourselves. Uh, any two of these are naturally occurring, and the rest are actually uh, a created. So the, the stone napping leavings, the leavings of creating stone tools. Uh, Professor Eberl, you don't get to answer. But does anybody sort of have a, have a guess of, of which ones might be created and which ones are just naturally occurring? Ooh, that's very good. So, so I have a question, uh, Victor. What uh, what makes you think that ENF might be natural? Um, the lines on the other ones. It, it was difficult to figure out if it would be C or F, but um, the lines on all the other ones have like a curvature to them that seems indicative of like a stress fracture. Mm -hmm. Whereas, especially with E, the topology of the surface looks more like it was eroded or something. Fantastic. Fantastic. William, how did you come up with a conchoidal? So I vaguely remember some engineering where when you break glass, I think it was, you get these beautiful curved surfaces and thin edges and things like that. So I'm just guessing flint might do that too. So that gives you kind of this rounded curve as was just mentioned instead of sort of straight lines and, and very thin edges too. I think it's called a conchoidal fracture. You've forgotten the right words. Well, this is amazing. And I would like to congratulate you on your deep learning networks that you have embedded in wetware in your brains. Uh, your pre-trained deep neural network, which is responsible for vision, has done a great job at picking out different parts of these that might be salient. What's the same? What's different? Uh, your semantic deep neural net has also done a really good idea of pulling up prior information that might be important. So here's a question. Why might we want to try to build a predictive model based on just the images rather than the derived measures. So the measures that were pre-programmed into that particle scanning device, why might you want to try one versus the other? Yeah, so some measurements are, might have errors, true. Um, yeah, you know, it could possibly be lower cost. And then there's also this, this thing where these kinds of features that we're talking about are not necessarily gonna be captured by that particle scanner. You know, that idea of, oh, the, the curvy conchoidal types of, of, of shapes that you're seeing, the weathering that you're seeing on ENF. Here's the answer, ENF are naturally occurring. The rest are, are, are created. So already using your visual system, you were able to begin to pick out some of these things. So how well could a deep learning network uh, uh, operate? And, and is it better than or worse than the straightforward machine learning one, which takes the derived measures? Well, frankly, I'd really like to know. And we're gonna be finding out. We're gonna be finding out in the next few weeks so you're gonna have to come back for another workshop to see whether this worked or not. But all indications are based on our little experiment right here that it will work and possibly very well. So what's the difference between machine learning and deep learning? Machine learning is structured data in, labeled structured data in, and simple outputs. So you make a prediction or you make a, a, a number of different predictions, but it's structured, simplified, it doesn't have to be simple data, but structured data in and then simple outputs, simple structured outputs. With deep learning, what we have going on is we have very complex and sometimes raw data going in, and then we can have complex things coming out. In this case, we're having just the same kind of prediction. They're both making a prediction, 
Was this experimentally de derived or did this come from a site? So good question, what do I mean by structured? Let's go ahead and take a look. So th think about this data, it's an image. It's just a bunch of pixels. This data is structured. These are different measures. You can almost think, in, you can call them engineered features of uh, different aspects. So you can think if I took a ruler and actually measured how wide uh, this particular B was and how long it was, how much light shone through B, these are all measures that I might take of it. Or in the deep learning approach, I can just take the image itself, not try to measure anything, but take the entire image and see how well that could do. The fact that you all were able to do fairly well means that a deep learning solution could probably work as well. So what, what else do I mean uh, by structured? Uh, oh yes, and actually, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Wouldn't it matter which plane the image is taken in? Absolutely. Remember that these particles are, are tumbling. So it's a, uh, and I think you only get one image per particle. If, if, uh, Professor Ebel, have you had a chance to dive into the images that are generated by your particle scanner yet? Um, yes, I looked a little bit into it. Unfortunately, uh, the particle analyzer provides mostly black and white images mm -hmm. with little contrast. So that's oh. one of the issues. All right, we'll have to see what we can get out of it and see how, how well it works. Um, but yes, it does matter what, what plane it's in and you don't have as much control. One of the nice things though about deep learning networks is uh, the vision networks tend to be pretty robust against transformations. Um, but it's an empirical question as to how well it can do in a situation like this. Oh, great. And, and Phyllis, thank you. Phyllis, uh, 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 also on the project, provides multiple images. Yeah, that's something that we can work with. So let's talk a little bit more by what I mean by complex outputs. So taking a scene, giving a deep learning network that does semantic segmentation, you can give it a scene and it will return to you that scene, but with all the different areas that it can label or know about uh, indicated, labeled. So for example, here you would see, all right, I've detected a person, I've given an outline of the person, I've detected a bike, I've outlined the bike, I've detected a truck, I've outlined a truck. So these are all different things that have been outlined and, uh, and can be labeled as well. So in machine learning, you would ask the question, is this a person, yes, no? And it's not terrifically robust to translations and zooming, and it's, kind of, it's hard to make it work with, with raw images, very hard. Deep learning network, you could take this picture from any angle. Uh, you could take this image under different lighting conditions and it will still uh, perform decently well. So some other examples of complex uh, output. Uh, oh, and question, oh, that's right. I'll let you all answer that online. So another, here's, here's kind of the cutting edge of complex output. Given a picture, can you generate motion from just what's in the picture? So you all have seen examples of this perhaps on, on social media where they have uh, uh, pictures. Uh, in, and I think Ancestry.com has actually purchased this model or, or developed the model where it actually adds movement, breathing, blinking, to pictures of ancestors and it's, uh, it's kind of cool. So here the challenge is even greater. Here's just a picture of a scene. Given the content of the scene, this is water, therefore water may flow. This is a person that looks like they're in a running stance, therefore it makes sense that they would continue running in that direction. These are our guesses that, that are being made by a deep learning network. What's going in is an image and what's coming out is video. So this type of high level complex information in, in this complex information coming out. You can see things like the train work really well and the beach works really well, golf works pretty well. The baby, not so much, pretty terrifying. Looks like the, the, the baby one just isn't working. Ah, you know, this is new technology. All right, here's another one, another example of complex information going in and complex information coming out. I'm gonna give you just a moment to answer this question. Whoops. Don't look at the answer. Uh, so take a moment, read this and answer this question. My question is how many square kilometers of rainforest is covered in the basin? And the context is this reading. So yes, you're back in the days of taking your SAT. 
When you have the answer, go ahead and put the answer in the, in the text chat. Uh, all right, so let's go and see what, uh, what we have going here. How many square, square, so you can actually do this online. We're gonna be doing this in just a little bit, as a matter of fact. So question and answer me, how many square kilometers of rainforest is covered in the basin? Give it the context and it can come up with an answer. Hello. This is what is called no shot uh, inference. This model was not given any pre-training on the Amazon or on anything really. This model was trained uh, using what's called self-supervised learning. And we're gonna be getting a little bit more into that in just a moment, but this received no special training. So this was just given text and then was asked to generate an answer to the question, cold, cold turkey. So the model has developed a sufficiently robust language model that was able to, in a sense, read the information, disentangle the information, translate the question into what the answer is. Let's see how well it worked. The basin encompasses 7 million square miles, of which 5.5 million square miles are covered in the rainforest. So it was able to translate from how many square kilometers of rainforest is covered in the basin into, uh, and, and to pull that information out. So deep learning is capable of these really amazing complex feats of complex information in, complex information out. So how does it do this? Well, uh, the first thing to note is that what we're talking about here is not just a difference of degrees between machine learning and deep learning, but a fundamental change in how they operate and what is possible. Machine learning features must be decided on, created, engineered, and fed to machine learning. Deep learning takes the complex information and forms those features and the complex relationship between the features and is able seemingly to develop higher order features as well. So not just letters, not just words, not just parts of speech, but concepts and collections of concepts as well in the case of transformers. The first revolution came with the convolutional neural networks where it was capable of performance that, uh, that is now human level, in some cases, superhuman level. Transformers over the last three years has been a similar sea change in uh, natural language processing where it is now capable of, uh, of, of tasks that are, are near human level, in some cases, a better than human. So how does this work? Well, I'd like to share this, uh, this very nice uh, uh, work that's, that's done by uh, three blue, one brown. And this gives you an idea of what, what a neural network looks like. So in this case, it's actually a pretty small neural network. And what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna see if you can recognize a letter from the MNIST data set. And what you do is you take the image and you pull out all of the pixels. And so this represents all of the pixels in the image just spread out. And what's happening is that you have connections between these different layers of the network. And if you have a pixel in this position and a pixel in this position, uh, you know, then they, they, they might combine it and they might have enough evidence to cause an activation of this network. Well, if this network is activated and this network is activated, then it might have enough to activate a deeper part until you get to the very end and it ends with a, with a uh, prediction of whether it's digit zero one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, or nine. So, but, so that's how the forward inferencing works. Forward inferencing works by activations flowing forward. But how do you set the weights? You could try to hand tune the weights, but some of these models have billions of parameters. You have dozens here. The larger models, like the model that was able to answer that question about the Amazon rainforest, has billions of, trans, uh, of, of parameters of weights and uh, approaching uh, trillions. So how do you learn? You learn through something that's called backpropagation. This is not 
a very human way to learn. This is not the way that human deep neural networks are trained, but it works. And the idea is if you have a correct signal, great. If you have an incorrect signal, then you go back and you change the weights that were responsible for that bad decision. So you back propagate that error and you adjust those weights accordingly based on what's called the gradient. And so you can adjust the weights and say, you gave me the wrong answer, therefore I'm gonna downweight you. Uh, so I might pick out one of these and say, whoa, this was the wrong answer. So I'm gonna downweight that weight right here. And then I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna downweight all the different weights that were responsible for this thing firing. And then I'm gonna go back to this and I'm gonna downweight all the weights that were responsible for this one firing. So you can watch it sort of flow forwards, inferencing forwards, and training backwards. Inference forward, here we do it again, inference forward, back prop for training and adjusting the weights. And you go through and do this again and again and again. So, uh, so question, is back propagation neural network the same as generative adversarial networks? No, but you do use the same type of technology for generative adversarial networks. Uh, maybe at the very end, we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth in depth because GANs are really interesting. So a couple of things. First of all, you have to have massive compute to do this. Uh, you have to have massive compute and you also have, uh, in the case of transformers, you need to have large amounts of GPU memory. Uh, in most cards that you might buy, so you could play your VR games or your first person shooters or any of the consumer grade, you're going to have about 11 gigabytes of video memory on your GPU. And you might have four to 600, what are called CUDA cores uh, that are commonly used for, for deep learning on your GPU. Whereas on your, your laptop, uh, you know, on your main memory, you're going to just have four, maybe six cores. So you have a lot more cores you don't have as much, as much memory. So these networks require a massive compute. GPU is the solution. GPU gives you the compute that you need in order to be able to do this because each of that feed forward and also the back propagation involves matrix multiplications and matrix multiplications going back. So special consideration, massive compute needed, solution, GPU. Second thing, you need to have large data sets in order to train these, these networks up from the ground up, to train them up from, from cold. Huge data sets. We're talking about millions, tens of millions, and a great deal of compute over time. This is sometimes you're talking about 100,000 or a couple of million dollars worth of AWS compute to create these models. So how do we even get to first base? Well, it turns out that you can use pre-trained models. So take our example here. I can sort of erase the last few layers of this network and use that same network that was originally trained to identify letters, but use it to identify, I'm sorry, to originally trained to identify numbers and do additional training so it could identify letters. And it turns out that results in a great deal of savings. And these are called pre-trained uh, deep neural nets. And there have been an explosion now in terms of the variety and types of pre-trained networks that you have, some for vision, some for language. And now you have pre-trained networks on almost every major language on earth. The people have been very busy the last three years. And also you have pre-trained networks that, that do things like move directly from wave to, uh, to speech or to, to concepts. And I'll, I'll talk about that again in just, just one moment. So large data sets are needed, but you can have pre-trained. Okay, even though I'll have a pre-trained network, I'm still going to need to have some additional tuning. So I'm still gonna to need to have some, some data sets so I can do a better job of training this network to recognize letters rather than numbers. Well, it turns out that there's a, a nice trick that you can do, which is called augmentation. So imagine that you have a letter, okay, O, all right. So you have letter O, you can do a couple of transforms with this. I can move this O around and train that. So I train the network on this one, but I also train it on this one. I also train it on this one. I train it on this one. I could even, uh, you know, let's say the O has a little bit of a shape to it. I can even rotate it a little bit. And all of those can count as additional training images, all labeled with O. Uh, and so you can augment your data and, and the trick is to come up with a very efficient ways of augmenting your data and to do it in, a, in an allow, allowable way. Uh, so 
For example, if I have the letter T, I can certainly rotate it around, but what I cannot do is flip it completely upside down. That is no longer a T. So there's a limit to how far you can rotate. There's a limit to what you can do. And the trick is to augment your images in a way that doesn't turn them into something else, but makes some different instances of the same thing that you're training on. The other thing that you can do is called self-supervision. And it turns out that this was key to the development of these extremely powerful natural language processing models that are able to do amazing things like answer questions about arbitrary text that you give it. Uh, and uh, let's take a look at, at what that self-supervision uh, uh, looks like. So here's, here's a quote from uh, Zora Neale Hurston from her, Their Eyes Were Watching God. And take a moment, if you would, and tell me what you think is the missing word here. Yep, I keep going. There, there are many, many answers. Mm, mm -hmm. I've seen some answers that I haven't thought of before. Yeah, keep on, keep on coming. Let me do a thumbs up. Oh, on it. Okay, that's good. All right, let's do a quick, uh, any others? All right, let's do a quick vote. How many people think that it was ooh, on them? That's good. How many of them, uh, give a thumbs up if you like them. Okay. That's William, absolutely. All right, let's, let's uh, how many of you like it? Thumbs up for it. Okay. Oh, and uh, Umang, if you could if you could clear these, uh, also. Um, then how about land? All right. How about board? Give thumbs up if you like board. It looks like board is sort of the favorite. Um, let me go ahead and let me ask you: How did you? Why did you vote for board? I'm going on picking someone if you don't mind. Have on board, semantically it made sense. Victor, absolutely. Yeah, it made most sense. It sort of fit in there, didn't it? Context, that's right. So it made sense in the, so the high level made sense context, but you know what? Let's go even deeper. How did you even know that it was supposed to be, a, you all said nouns. Everything that you chose was a noun. How did you know that it was supposed to be a noun instead of a verb? And more poetic, yes. Yes, prepositions go with nouns. These are, you've learned about the language. So at the low level, you've learned, well, first of all, you learned that the answer was comprised of letters, right? And then you also knew that the answer was comprised of, had to be in the class of nouns, even though you were doing this automatically, right? And then you even went higher to a higher level concept of it works with the sea, it works with the ship on board. And then, well, you mentioned poetically. So there's even higher concept here where it fits with, with the vision of this. And this is the very first line of, of, her, of her book, as a matter of fact. And it's just a, a wonderful poetic, you know, bringing you into the story. So it turns out that deep learning networks, in particular transformer-based deep learning networks, are capable of learning these same types of clues if you give it millions of documents and if you also train it in the way that we just did. So what you do is you actually mask a word and you have it guess what that word is. Now you go from having very little labeled data to having all the labeled data that you want because it's called self-supervised, meaning the answer is in the data itself. Which word actually belongs there? All I have to do is pick up my copy of Their Eyes Were Watching God and I can see that it said bored. And you can choose, you can take out other words. You can say blank set a distance have every man's wish on board. What's the word that goes in there? Ships. So again, you train these deep neural nets on this, again, incredibly intensive, uh, expensive compute. Now you're talking on the order of being able to, to power a medium-sized city for a number of weeks with the amount of compute that it takes to train some of these models. 
Great questions. How do you deal with synonyms? Those come from context. And the lovely thing about this is that words have the same, that have the same meaning, even though they may be spelled entirely differently or be different words, but if their, their usage is the same in a sentence, those come together. And that was the big difference between these transformer models and the other earlier work in what were called embeddings. Excellent. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit how you might do this with images because you know images could benefit from self-supervised learning. But one thing is you can chop up an image and turn it into a puzzle piece. Say here are the different pieces, rearrange this in a way that makes sense. And so the deep learning network can sort of try to rearrange the image and learn that way. Joe had a question about other languages. Uh, you're gonna be seeing now that there are many dozens of languages now that have been trained in this way. It's very exciting. Another way uh, is shuffling the sequence of a video and having the model learn about the proper sequence of the, that model. It probably is some of the training that under, was underpinning that recent work that we saw that guessed about the motion that came after a particular static image. All right, with the good, of course, comes the bad. Uh, where do we learn? Uh, all of this text, for example. Uh, we learn the text from the writings that we ourselves produced. So the algorithm may or may not itself make biased mistakes, but let me ask you this, just, I'm a, I'm a visitor from Mars. I'm an anthropologist from Mars. Would you say that in your writings that you can find online, which is what most of these things are trained on, there's any evidence of bias based on race? Or are all writings on the internet free of bias from race? Yeah. How about bias with uh, sex? Yes. And so pick a number of these different dimensions. And you're gonna find that the writing that we produce because you know, we have institutional, right? Institutional racism, we have institutional sexism, and that is reflected in the writings that we have. So guess what these models learn? They learn that and they learn the bias and they learn it very well. So let's take a look at some of these examples. And this is the warning about these deep neural networks because we tend to think it's AI, it can't be biased, it's an algorithm but it learns from us. So let's take a look at uh, some semantic labeling of parts of images here. Um, so you show an image of the person on the left and what you get is tags of public speaking, speech, business suit, speaker, business person, official, spokesperson. You feed another image to the right, you know, also government official, what do you get? television presenter, you know, it's actually, I believe this is a congresswoman, smile, hair, hairstyle, chin, person. So that just comes directly from that semantic segmentation and labeling. Um, this is what's being produced. Let's take another example. How well do these algorithms work on tracking facial expressions and differentiating parts of the face? Well, it actually turns out that a lot of these algorithms are terrible with darker skin. They begin to fail. In case you can't guess, that algorithm on the right is doing a terrible job of figuring out that this person is not smiling. As a matter of fact, it can't even map some of the features correctly at all. And then uh, with image, uh, we have these cool algorithms can upsample. So if you wanna take an image which is lower a lower uh, resolution and move it to a higher resolution. They used to be science fiction stuff. You might remember Blade Runner when the detective puts the picture in there and says, uh, enhance. And I was in computer science at the time and I laughed. It's like, there's no such thing as enhance. You can't do that. Well, now you can. However, it's making guesses and filling in the information it doesn't have. So what is it filling in? It's filling in with what it's been trained on, which is primarily white faces. So it turns, Barack Obama into a not Barack Obama 
who is apparently white. So these are the, the challenges that we face with deep learning networks. We can't just take what they're creating. We need to use them. We need to learn how to use them. We need to learn how, how to work with this, but know that uh, uh, Timnit Gebru calls this the, the stochastic parrot. Uh, I think of it as sort of the, the, the mirror that reflects back to us what we are and what we've put into it. All right, let's talk a little bit. Um, oh, good question. Uh, so just like machine learning, if the training data is imbalanced, the prediction won't be good. Um, yes, and because we're asking so much of these deep learning networks, uh, then that, that imbalance or that, bi that, 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 uh, uh, that the bias can come through in many, many different ways. All right, so let's talk now about how you do this stuff. And yes, I, I agree, Tim Nickeberu is a champion. So let's talk about how you might actually do these things because we've been talking about how complex this is. Well, it turns out there's some beautiful frameworks that allow you to do work. So what I'm showing you here is a, uh, is a notebook which is up on Google Colab. So I'm running everything on Google Colab. And this is from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, running a framework that's called fast.ai. And uh, uh, Imang, if you could put the link in there to fast.ai, just put it in the, in the chat. And the idea here is that this is a framework, a high level framework, which is sitting on top of uh, PyTorch. So it automatically gives you access to the GPUs, which would otherwise be very difficult to do. It relieves you of the pressure of having to code everything low level. And it also provides you with these pre-trained networks that you can begin with. And so your work actually is vastly simplified. And with fast.ai, uh, what it does, I'm just gonna go through, this is, a, they also have great online courses and this is, this is an example of one. So uh, with this single line, right here, where you're defining, in this case, you're defining a pets database. And what I'm gonna be doing here, not right now, is training a classifier that'll take all different, speed, all different types of dogs and tell me what kind of dog this is an image of. A very tough problem because there are dozens and dozens of different types of dogs. And sometimes I only have a few pictures of them. But so what do I need to do? Anybody remember, if I only have a little bit of training data, what are some of the things that I might be able to do to increase the number of training examples that I have. So let's say I have a picture of a leopard hound. What might I do to a picture of the leopard hound to give me more training examples? Yeah, that's right. These are augmentation, rotate, transform, but not too much transform because dogs don't sit on their head, most. Um, yeah, so data augmentation, fantastic. Well, what's happening here in this single call is it's creating the proper size data object and it is also resizing everything for me and it is augmenting for me. In a single command, this is gonna be GPU-based augmentation. And so it's gonna handle that for me. As much as it is safe to augment, it will augment. And based on the images, it will make good decisions about what augmentation is safe. But now I need to train my model. Well, in my model, um, uh, I'll, I'll want to go and, and uh, and, uh, and train. And it turns out that the training code is really just a few lines as well. I had a little bit of trouble running that. So the training actually turns out to be uh, just about a single uh, line. So here, this is the first instance of training. There are so many decisions that need to be made for training. For example, that pre-trained network well, here's the loading up of the pre-chain network, one called ResNet 34. But based on the type of data that's coming in, based on the decisions you're asking it to, to make, it will make good choices about all these hyperparameters, about learning rate and earlier about augmentation, about all these different things that you can do to improve your model. So in the fast.ai network uh, framework, you can stay very high level or you can go to these medium level if you actually want to mess around a little bit more with the models or even low level API calls. So you can actually change the structure of the network that you're training. So whether you wanna do, you're more concerned about the model or more concerned about how the model is working, it, uh, it gives you 
uh, freedom uh, to do both. So fast.ai, great framework for doing a number of different things, including some text. But there's another set of tools that I want to talk to you about for text, and that is called Hugging Face. So actually, first, real quickly, oh, uh, can this technology use uh, uh, use photo, uh, photogrammetry te techniques with the source image to help train itself? You could absolutely add that in um, uh, using the fast.a framework and see how well it works. Excellent. So Hugging Face. Hugging Face is a collection of models that are available to you that are all based on transformer technology. This is that, that sea change, that revolution in these models that do uh, deep learning, and these are called attention-based models, uh, that work with text. Now, here's the interesting thing. It's not just text. What it's doing is it's working with signals over time, symbols over time. Text just happens to be one of them. So it doesn't matter what language you're using, you just need to use those self-supervised techniques to actually train up the model so it can learn that language. So these models that we were working with just earlier learn the English language. You can have it learn French. You could have it learn Yoruba. You could have it learn any language. We have enough of a corpus and it can do that trick of masking words, guessing what that word is, because in order to guess what that word is, it has to first learn the language model for Yoruba. Then it has to learn the concepts that are often talked about in Yoruba. And then you can actually then have a Yoruba trained model in addition to having the English trained model or any other language that you, that you like. But you can do beyond just languages. Think about different ways where you might have concepts encoded in symbols. Think about sequencing DNA. That signals over a long period of time. And indeed, transformers have been used for that. Uh, think about speech. So waveforms. So traditionally, what we do is we start with the waveform, and then we turn it into words, and then we do NLP on that. But if they're just symbols, could it be possible to train something that would simply be trained on the waveform, so the signal, the speech itself, and learn concepts from the spoken word? It turns out, yes, absolutely, you can. So you can have a model which is pre-trained on just speech and then be able to go work backwards and say, I don't know what the words are necessarily that were spoken, but the person was talking about cats. Really pretty amazing. Yes, and Joe kind of likes Shazam. Shazam is doing like a matching. In this case, what you could do is train on, on uh, transformers and, and models of this type have been used for this as well. Uh, look at OpenAI and their MuseNet. So you can actually say, well, here's a song, recreate the song, but in the style of Madonna. So you can take a classical song and then cast it in a rock format because all of these are concepts that are learned over time by masking, learning, and then learning about the concepts around music. Um, if there's a large enough corpus of dolphins, certainly could, perhaps. It's an empirical question. Please go and try. All right. So uh, I'd like to take just five. I, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you this. I'm going to ask you all to to try this out on your own. You don't have quite enough time. There's been great questions. Don't have quite enough time to do uh, a breakout rooms. But uh, I'm going to put the uh, the link uh, to uh, to Hugging Face uh, here in the chat. Well, let's see if I can get this to shift Alt H. Okay, I can't. So I'm gonna, it's just huggingface.co. So actually, if you could just put that in the, uh, in the chat uh, there in long, that would be great. And if you go there and if you take a look at models, the interesting thing about Hugging Face is that it gives you an inferencing engine. So you can choose one of these, like Distilbert, and it will give you a model description that's called a model card talking about how to use the model, how to call the model, and uh, uh, caveats. And then it gives you this, which is called the hosted inference API. So here you can actually type a long sentence and ask it to fill in the word. So you can do this interactively. You can do this right now. 
You can also go after and see how well these different ones do with question answering. You'll see this one I stole directly from, from here, which is uh, give it context, give it whatever text you want. Uh, during a, a lecture earlier, we were at a law school class. And what we did was we went to the one of the models that was trained, tuned on legal documents. And we had the law students enter in different aspects of law, you know, uh, and, and to see if you could guess what the charge was or what the legal term was. And it did really pretty well. I, I think it was a little bit concerning to them because it was making pretty good legal just judgments on the on the uh, uh, based on the evidence that was there. So this is something that you can try out right now. So questions about these two frameworks. It's always a risky thing to give people a link because uh, now you all are, are trying it and that's fine. I'd like to end by sharing two, uh, a couple of cool announcements. So first of all, if you are uh, interested in this and want to do more with this, you're gonna need to know Python. That's how you use both the fast.ai and how you use the hugging face models. They both offer pretty high level APIs. So you don't have to be a, a master in Python, but you do need to have a good, a good grounding. Well, in May, May 17th through 21st, we're going to be offering uh, what we call an intensive set of workshops. Um, they're going to run Monday through Friday, 10 to 12, and there'll be homework associated with it as well. It is free. It's going to be also virtual. It's going to be the basics to get you started, and all are welcome to this. Then May 24th to 28th, the following week, we're going to have another intensive workshop on deep learning with Python. And this is actually using these frameworks to solve real world problems. Um, and, and I'll be emailing you the details on this, as a matter of fact, so you can actually sign up for this. It won't be, the first will be on Eventbrite, the second one won't because the second one you have to apply for. Uh, the second one is gonna be more intensive. We're gonna have to have assistance sort of help us with this. So the enrollment is more limited to that one. However, with the second one, you will have priority if you are, uh, if you're doing research, if you have a data set on which these types of tools could be used, then if you can just sort of state very generally what you would like to do with these, because the goal for both of these workshops are to establish new areas of research and deep learning across Vanderbilt University. So if you're a researcher, you'll have higher priority if you have an idea and if you have data. And if you're unsure about if you have a good idea or not, actually come and sign up for, uh, for some time. We're happy to talk you through and see what the possibilities would be. You also have higher priority if more than one person from your lab, from your lab shows up for the network, so for the, uh, signs up for this. So if you, an undergraduate student or a postdoc, if you were both there, because the goal is that we successfully create these programs, these different research programs across Vanderbilt, wherever people are welcoming them. And if two people in the same lab actually are learning this, then it's much more likely that it will, that it will take hold. So uh, we'll be sending an email out a little bit later on today with the, with the links to this so you can uh, uh, fill out the application and, and hopefully join us. Questions about the workshops? Uh, Jesse, can you show me again how to use uh, that hugging face? Emily yes. talks about the film mask and the context. Yes, absolutely. So if you go to hugging face and click models, you can click on any of these models and they will each have different types of inference interfaces. So you can select particular ones that you might want to have over here. Fill mask means that you take out a word and you put the word mask there. And then you ask the model to guess what the word is that's missing. Question answering is you give it a longer text of context and then you type a question and then it answers the question. Uh, you might have table question answering or summarization or text classification text generation. Um, they don't yet have wave to concept yet, but they just added that model just about four weeks ago. It's amazing. So you choose any one of those and then you'll get to the inference interface 
And I'll be happy to answer more detailed questions about that after this. Okay, and Victory, the question, are they open to non vendable affiliates? Yes, especially that first one. The second will be open based on availability. So absolutely. And Joe, WAVE is in waveform. Absolutely. That's right. We're talking about a WAVE file of just, just speech. Other questions? All right. Then a couple of workshops you might be interested in coming up. Uh, one is going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be next week. And this is going to be, uh, I'll be speaking on deep learning ethics and, and human culture. We touched on some of those today, but then we're going to have someone reflecting on this from history, from philosophy, from media and literature. So you're going to get sort of this, this wide view of what it means that we now have these models that can learn concepts. And what does it mean that what it's doing is reflecting back to us uh, our own ideas? Is it learning? You know, are we, have we achieved artificial intelligence? You know, what, are the, what is the impact of this? And what does this mean for the humanities? And then uh, also a little bit after that, Deep Learning for the Humanities will be doing a, a deeper dive into applications of all of these technologies in the humanities. All right. And, uh, and finally, I, I can't quite make the announcement now, but, but we, are, we, are, uh, we are near to being able to announce the opportunity to have access to some significant GPU compute for these types of models. So shortly, we'll be able to announce that across Vanderbilt, you will have access to the resources that you need to create world leading deep learning solutions in your particular area of expertise. So more on that later. Fantastic. Let's open this up for questions now. We just have a few minutes. What questions do you have? Victor, go ahead. And you can unmute yourself. Um, I just have a specific architecture that I've mm -hmm. been working on for months and kind of wrestling with mm -hmm. trying to use unsupervised learning in like mm -hmm. a convolutional neural network way um, to transform different multi-layer complex graph signals mm -hmm. based on like an output signal. Yeah. And I just, I've heard that sometimes IPUs are better than GPUs for that. I've heard different things about a bunch of stuff, just if you were trying to create that, what which direction for software and harder, yeah. hardware would you go? Sure. GPUs, definitely. Uh, the NVIDIA GPUs, definitely. The larger, the better. Um, especially if those if the signals are very long in, in nature. Oh, you're, you're using CNNs, though. So, so that, that, that works a little bit better. Um, I, I would, uh, I personally would go the route of PyTorch. And if you're just getting, if you're just learning a, a deep learning, or if you don't want to futz with all of the, the specific details, I'd look into fast.ai. But the other thing that I would do is there are some brand new uh, packages coming out that assist you in doing this self-supervised learning. So if you have a large corpus of labeled data and you're set, fantastic. Think about custom ways that you might be able to do augmentation on that. But if you don't have a lot of labeled data, Think about going the route of self-supervised learning. These packages are doing a beautiful job of empowering people uh, to, to apply the principles of, of self-supervised learning without having to code everything from the ground up. Michael, you had a question. How are you collecting emails for your future course or is it only via Eventbrite? It is a via Eventbrite and also uh, if you registered for the course using the Google form. So I'll be, I'll be doing both. Uh, let's see, there was a question above. Do you have any resources that do a good job of explaining data science, AI, ML, uh, and compares them? Which to go into? Yeah, Joe, it's, it's uh, um, uh, everyone is welcome to just sign up for a half hour consult, even if you're, you're not with uh, Vanderbilt. Um, you can visit the, the data science webpage. You go to uh, Vanderbilt Data Science, and you can find us there. You're welcome to sign up for a half hour uh, discussion about that a little bit more in depth. I do believe that deep learning is going to because it's capable of so much is, is going to be very much the wave of the future. Uh, 
machine learning will absolutely still have its ha have its place. You're going to find more and more people turning to machine learning, especially as the infrastructure gets built to allow people to do this very fast inferencing um, and uh, stand up solutions. Excellent. Other questions? All right. We're at the end of the time. I'm welcome. I, I'm very happy to sit around for just a few more minutes. But for everyone else, thank you so much for joining. Uh, glad you were able to uh, to make it today. Hope you can make it uh, for next week when we are talking about what are we talking about next week? Uh, oh yes, we're talking about making Jupyter notebooks work for you. See you all next week. And for those of you sticking around, any additional questions? You're very welcome, Chris. Uh, the, the Python course will be on Eventbrite uh, later on today, but let's not say until tomorrow. Uh, when do we need to fly for the May Deep Learning Workshops? Also today, I have the form completed and I will email it out. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. That's very kind. You too, Michael. Thank you, Lee. Glad to hear you'll join us again, Joe. You're very welcome, Catherine. You're welcome, John. Thank you, Angle. Oh, any words on backpropagation? Oh, yes, absolutely. So GAN, a generative adversarial network is actually a combination of a couple of different deep learning models. One of them, is operating as sort of the traditional way of doing that identification. And so you have one that's trying to guess, and so it's operating very much like the ones that we saw earlier. And you have another one which is trying to create fakes. And so they're, they're sort of in competition with one another. And what happens is that, uh, that you have uh, the, the discriminator trying to determine whether something was true or was generated. And then you have the other one which is trying to generate as good a fakes as possible. So they're both doing backpropagation actually on their own. They have their own set of weights, they have their own deep neural nets. So backpropagation is a part of each of these individual networks. And they're both examples of neural networks. Do you know of any resources that explain how the computing model is implemented with CUDA cores? Um, Are you talking about sort of engineering kind of uh, information, uh, Joe? And Victor, have you used uh, Perceptilab? I have not. You seem highly interested in uh, whether it's going past a little bit quick. Um, oh, that's great. I will look that up. Iman, when you mind capturing uh, Perceptilabs, if you use a pre-trained model, are you limited to the structure of that model or can be augmented changed? It can absolutely be augmented and changed, absolutely. Uh, one way of doing fine tuning on a model is that you allow additional learning on the layer, on, on the later layers, but you can do much deeper surgery than that if you wish. You can cut uh, much deeper. You can change the numbers or types of outputs that are allowed. Um, just had a master's student who did an amazing project on uh, 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 an architecture called UNET, and he's able to apply, you know, brand to swap in whole new types of, of networks uh, for, uh, for, for part of the UNET, uh, just swap and go. Oh, how to program in it, ooh. It's bringing back, bringing back memories, uh, Joe. I, I did some very early work with programming CUDA, and it was not pretty at the time. Uh, NVIDIA has excellent resources, though, the full technical specifications. The idea is that they look very much like RISC, uh, you know, RISC computers in that you have a much more reduced instruction set. Uh, you also have additional commands that have to do with moving data. So think along the lines of simple uh, operations. There are also these things that are called TPUs. These are tensor processor units, and they handle tensors, which is full matrices, rather than just doing vector-based operations. Very, very fast, very optimized. Excellent, Darren. Glad to hear that you're going to be applying. Uh, I have not done anything with Intel's OpenVINO. Oh, 
All right, other questions? Let's go and call it to a close then, unless there are more questions. You're very welcome. See you all again soon.